Did you know that a mobile phone has a hundred billion switches on a chip the size of your fingernail? Have you ever wondered why laptops keep getting faster and cheaper? Whether you're a techno wizard or you don't know a terabyte from a terabit, join me in the race to build the ultimate computer. Good evening and welcome to the Royal Institution. All around the world, scientists and engineers are locked in a fierce competition. The outcome will decide the future of mobile phones, laptops, games consoles, hundreds of other digital devices. It's a race to build the ultimate computer and at its heart is the need for speed. Everyone wants to build faster computers. Now, computers have not been around for very long, but we can see just how much they've evolved already by looking at the world of computer games. Here's an example of a modern computer game, and you can see the very realistic graphics, something we've all become used to. But if we go back just 30 years, things looked very different. This is a classic computer game from 1978. It's called Space Invaders. And on the screen here, you can see a little clip of Space Invaders. And you see the graphics are very primitive, they're all two-dimensional, very slow. And in fact, they're all in black and white. And so the manufacturers of the console, and if we can just bring the camera and take a look at this, they put strips of coloured plastic over the screen to try to make it look like it was a colour display. Then in 1981, we had the BBC Micro. And here we can see a game running on the BBC Micro called Elite. Now, the improved processing power of this computer allowed it to have a very primitive form of three-dimensional graphics. This is called wireframe. Then in 1994, we had this, the first PlayStation. And we can see it here running a game called Gran Turismo. This is a racing game. And because of the increased processing power of this console, we actually have solid three-dimensional objects. And the movement of the cars is based on physics. However, the landscape appears rather flat and unrealistic because the process is not fast enough to imitate real-world depth and light. And then finally, here's a modern games console, and here we see it running a game called Fable 2. The graphics are now much more realistic, fully three-dimensional. We see reflections and shadows, all rendered in real time at high resolution. Now, the dramatic improvement in the graphics over the 30-year period since Space Invaders is a direct result of the huge growth in the processing speed of computers. While Space Invaders could do 500,000 instructions per second, a PlayStation 3, or this Xbox 360, can do over 300 billion. And it's not just games consoles that have been getting faster. Computers generally have been doubling in speed every two years. And this has been happening for the last 50 years. Now, when something doubles in a fixed time interval, it leads to a very dramatic kind of growth. We call it exponential growth. It's the way, for example, that populations grow. So here we see a population of bacteria. Now, every 20 minutes, each bacterium splits in two. So the total number of bacteria doubles every 20 minutes. And we see it starts off rather slowly, and then it takes off in this very dramatic way. Now, we can see for ourselves what exponential growth looks like by doing a little experiment. So if we can bring one of the handheld cameras in, we can have a look at this. So in this box, I have 225 armed mouse traps, And on each mouse trap, we have a ping-pong ball. Now, in a moment, we're going to take one more ping-pong ball, and we're going to drop it in through this hole in the top. And it's going to set off a chain reaction. And in this chain reaction, the number of ping pong balls flying through the air is going to grow exponentially. OK, so who would like to volunteer to come and set this off? <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Um, let's have you there. Yep. Yes, you'd like to make your way along the end of the road. <laughs> if you'd like to... Would you like to come and stand just there? 
And just, uh, just turn that way. Okay, that's good. And what's your name? Matthew. Matthew. Matthew, you'd like to hold that. Mm -hmm. Now, in a moment, we're going to give you a 3, 2, 1 countdown. Okay? When we get to go, all I want you to do is to place the ball in through that little hole at the top. You manage that? Yeah? Yep. Okay. Are we ready? 3, 2, three, 1, one go. go! Amazing. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so, so we have a high-speed camera that was looking at that, and perhaps we can just do a little action replay and see that in slow motion. So there's the first ball, setting off a couple more. Each of those is setting off several more. And on that curve, we can see the number of balls growing in this very dramatic way. And what's really impressive about exponential growth is that the rate of growth is itself growing exponentially. Now, the exponential growth of computer power is truly staggering. It means, for example, that the computers that will be made in the next two years have as much processing power as all the computers ever made from the very first computer up to the present day. If cars had improved at the same rate as personal computers, then a typical family car today would travel 43,000 times faster than a Formula One racing car, <laughs> and it would go 200 times around the world on one litre of petrol. Now, that amazing improvement in speed is made possible because of this. This is a microprocessor. And this is the microprocessor in its packaging. What we see here are gold contacts which connect the microprocessor to the rest of the computer. And on the other side is the processing chip itself. Now, to me, this is one of the most remarkable pieces of engineering ever created. On this chip, there are over 400 million components. And tiny chips like this have changed the world. We can see here a photograph of the surface of this chip. This has been magnified 100 times, and it's showing just a fraction of the incredible complexity of the circuitry. Now, as well as being very complex, processors are also very fast. For instance, they're very good at doing arithmetic. So let's just see how good you are at doing arithmetic. Okay. I'm going to bring up some arithmetical questions, and as soon as you know the answer, I want you to shout it out as loudly as you can. Okay, here comes the first one. Twelve. Twelve. Okay, excellent. Next one. Sixty-three. Excellent. Next one. <laughs> okay, not quite so easy. Well, a microprocessor like this can do a calculation like that and get the right answer in a nanosecond. That's a billionth of a second. Now, that sounds very fast, but just how long is a nanosecond? <coughs> well, to find out, please welcome Hamish McLeod. <laughs> Hamish. <laughs> <clears throat> Hamish, welcome to the Christmas lectures. Now, you're a licensed firearms expert, yes. and uh, you've brought a powerful-looking gun with you. Can you tell us something about that? Yes, yes. This is a .22 air rifle. Uh, it's probably one of the most powerful air rifles that's available on the market today. And uh, certainly this gun would shoot a lead pellet just about as fast as any air rifle could. OK, impressive. What we're going to do, then, is we're going to time the pellet from this gun. Now, to help us do that, we've got some special apparatus over here. In a moment, we're going to mount the gun in this stand, and then we're going to fire it at this target. Now, if we look here, what we see is that the target consists of a circuit board, and on the circuit board, we've etched a pattern, a zigzag pattern of copper wire. So when the pellet from the gun passes through this circuit board, it will break an electrical circuit. Now, about 30 centimetres back, we have a second target with the same pattern of copper wire, and that's also connected to the same circuit. So the circuit will tell us the time from the pellet passing through the first board to the pellet passing through the second board. And the answer will appear on this laptop. So, Hamish, if you're all ready to load up. Certainly. OK. And uh, once Hamish is all set, we'll give him a 3, 2, 1 countdown, OK? Are we ready? Everybody? Yes. OK. Three, two, one, go! Whoa! <laughs> 
Okay, well that looked pretty much instantaneous to me, but apparently it took just over two million nanoseconds, that's two thousandths of a second, for that pellet to travel 30 centimetres. So in that time, our microprocessor could have done just over two million complex arithmetical calculations. Okay, Hamish, thank you very much indeed for joining us. So computers are extremely fast, and they're getting faster every year. And it's this amazing growth in power that's fueled the digital revolution. It's transformed the nature of entertainment, of communications, of healthcare. In fact, almost every aspect of our lives has been touched or even revolutionized by the microprocessor. And this is just the beginning. If microprocessors continue to improve in power, their impact could be far greater still. But a couple of years ago, we hit a big problem, which threatens to stop further growth in the speed of microprocessors. Now, to understand what the problem is and what we're going to do about it, please join me after the break.